Thank you all for sticking around. And uh, this session uh, will be looking at the decline of democracy, what are its drivers and what can be done. And we have three very distinguished speakers um, sitting next to me. And I have to get my phone out because she has two books I want to mention. Um, is Meredith Weiss, who is a professor of political science at um, SUNY Buffalo. And she also, Albany, sorry, 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 sorry. And she also, I'm, I'm still a bit rattled. And she also runs the SUNY uh, DC program. So she uh, is, moves around a lot. Um, coming out this month will be a book that is called Civil and Uncivil Society in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's a Rutledge uh, book and it looks really interesting and, and very important given the discussion, discussion um, that we've just been having. So I urge you all to rush to Rutledge's website and get it. Um, and the other book, is uh, mobilizing for elections, which is a, a, with a lot of uh, wonderful political scientists. It's, there's four authors. We're having a New York Southeast Asia book talk on this book on the 15th of March, uh, right before the, the Asso Association of Asian Studies conference in Boston. So please come back. It will be here at the Wagner Building for Meredith and her co-authors. It should be a very stimulating because it's all about Southeast Asia, stimulating conversation. So Meredith will be our first speaker. Our second speaker, and I'm gonna do this all right now so that you guys can just go right for the other guys, these wonderful women. Um, <laughs> Sheila Coronel, I'm sure a lot of you know of her. She is a professor at the Columbia Journalism School and heads this Stabil Center for Investigative Reporting. She's originally from the Philippines and was very, very important and brave in writing about Marcos, the fall of Marcos, the beginning of democracy. And she's kept her hand in, written probably the most important work on Duterte's drug wars and the destruction Duterte has done to Philippines democracy. And she just uh, this book just came out, The Marcos Era, and she has an amazingly interesting story, uh, essay in here on uh, the relationship between the counterinsurgency and the ideology of the state in um, the Philippines. And it is available through Antoneo's website. Uh, and it looks like there's a wonderful collection of very important articles in here. So that's very thrilling. Uh, and she has many articles. She writes a lot for the Atlantic. She, she uh, has some wonderful stuff on memory of the Marcos era on the Asian American Writers Workshop website. Uh, so look her up. Uh, and then next to her, we've already listened to uh, wonderful Nava, who is an expert on many issues and all things Indonesian. So without further ado, that I will love to my own devices go well over time. I may still do that. But. All right, so I've been asked to talk about Malaysia um, and thanks very much to uh, Margaret and John and, and others who organized this. So Malaysia's 15th general election on the 9th of November, GE15 confirms Malaysia's position as something of an outlier in the region and also in a workshop on democratic decline. It'd be hard to make a case for democratic strengthening in the works as a result of the election, but the health of Malaysian democracy may be no worse than before. So what is it that we do see? I'll give a quick overview of the results, then my take on what they represent, and then I'll briefly put that in the context of democratic decline. And I will say that there are no two perspectives that are precisely alike on how to make sense of Malaysia now, so this is just one of them. Um, and all told, I would I think that we're seeing a mishmash of politically liberal and illiberal inclinations and deinstitutionalization of the system that was, but not necessarily backsliding. So first, in terms of the results, as most analysts and polls predicted, the election resulted in a hung parliament. The BN lost a lot of support, the Barisan Nacional, the National Front. So their tally of seats won dropped from 79 in 2018 to 30 in 2022. It's a, you know, seen on a graph. I didn't do slides, but it's a pretty sharp drop, although it had been dropping already. So it's incremental as well. Pakatan Harapan, this is Anwar's coalition, um, the Alliance of Hope, 
they declined from 113 seats, which included Mahathir's party Bursatu in 2018, to 82. And newcomer Purikata Nasional, the National Alliance, which is comprised of Bursatu, Mahathir's old party, now without him, uh, the Islamist party PAS and Grakan Rakyat Malaysia, this small multiracial party, mostly Chinese, they ranked in 73 of those lost seats. So within Prikatan or PN, the PAS had won 18 seats on its own in 2018, and it won 48. This is the Islamist party in 2022, making it the single largest party in parliament, benefiting not just from support for political Islam, but also from a protest vote against UMNO President Zahid, was not the prime minister, but could have been. Um, and I'm um, no among voters who prefer a Malay communal party, but not a super corrupt one. And I will say, I'm assuming some familiarity with the names of parties and coalitions and so on in Malaysia. If there are a lot of acronyms, if I lose someone, just you know, shout out and I'll I'll explain. Um, so PAS is most of the time our tribal DAP, the Democratic Action Party, ranks next in parliament with 41 seats, only one fewer than in 2018. But of course, the status quo pre-GE15 was exceptionally messy. And if you've, heard, if you've heard anything about Malaysia in those intervening years, it's that. Um, so Pakatan had won a majority of seats in GE14 in 2018, the last election, and formed the government, then lost it 22 months later in the midst of COVID and, and machinations. That was with former BN Prime Minister Mahathir at the helm. The so-called backdoor government of BN, PAS, and most of Mahathir's Bursatu, plus a significant faction from Anwar's Ka'adilan, came into power in February 2020. That coalition collapsed in 2021 when UMNO withdrew its support for Bursatu and for Prime Minister Muhyiddin, who was from Bursatu at that point and not from UMNO, though previously UMNO. The government then reorganized, still without an election as of August 2021. Um, UMNO's Ismail Sabri was Prime Minister with the help of an MOU or confidence and supply agreement with Pakatan. So it's not as though the balance of power as of May 10th, 2018, right after the last election, looked all that similar to the balance on the eve of the election in November 22, 2022. And it also does not look like what had been this, many were prematurely proclaiming as a democratic transition had actually meant a particularly democratic order, quite the reverse. So I won't go into the gory details, but after the 20. The, the, the GE15, the November election, after a few days of wrangling and grandstanding and audiences with the king and storming off into cars and viral TikTok videos, we had a coalition. On Mars PM, presiding over a coalition government comprised of essentially everyone except PN, Parikatan, notwithstanding all sorts of talk before the election of a possible big tent or anyone but UMNO coalition approach. So Pakatan is there representing most non-Malays. So Pakatan secured less than 15%, probably about 13% overall of the Malay vote, but nearly all Chinese votes, something like half a percent voted for, for Parikatan. Um, UMNO was there with its diminutive BN partners, the MCA and MIC for Chinese and Indians respectively. Sarawak's GPS is there with 23 seats, Sabah's GRS with six and Marisan with three. Over, overall, 148 out of 222 seats gives this unity government a two thirds supermajority. That said, it is not clear what they plan to do with that power beyond keeping hold of the reins. So what do the results mean? GE15 decisively ended the country's dominant party system. That's about the only thing we can say decisively. What might, it, might take its place is in flux. So how competitive, how polarized, how politically liberal, how stable an order might emerge. The settlement between Pakatan and BN resolved an immediate impasse, but it relied upon the obfuscation of real programmatic, ideological, and identity differences, raising questions of longer-term durability or results. So I'll consider this in terms of parties, political culture norms, public policies. None of these definitively indicates democratic erosion, but none looks all that propitious either. So in terms of the party system, we see deinstitutionalization. There is no longer a clear pattern of which parties are most salient in terms of vote share and how they line up vis-a-vis -vis one another, the core of what it means to have an institutionalized party system. Indeed, during the campaign, both PH and especially Prikata Nacional, PN, component parties had to explain, like TikTok videos and posters, what coalition the party was in and what voters should look for on the ballot. At the same time, we see de, de reification if you'll pardon the jargon, of individual parties. It is harder for individuals to differentiate among contenders. Most obviously, there are multiple Malay communal parties all wooing the same base in the same way. 
So taking coalitions as parties, since that's how they tend to register, coalition identity is also hazy along the margins. So PN, for instance, contested just as PAS, as the Islamic party in the PAS stronghold states of Klantan and Tranganu. Their slogan was Undila Bulan, the vote for the, the moon, the PAS symbol. So, or, or you have Muda, this small youth party that seemed more loyal to Pakatan than vice versa and so forth. Meanwhile, and with likely really enduring effects, we see, we see that party identity is now less core to political identity than in Malaysia's past. Among voters, we could already see in pre-election polling that the mass of younger voters, there are many more of them because of a decline in the voting age from 21 to 18, that they lacked party loyalty. Polls found a real mix among cohorts uh, in terms of what would, would drive vote choice, but especially early in the campaign. So it was still largely party among Chinese voters, about 40%, but it was far less for anyone else. So overall, the most significant factor was the local candidate, suggesting a turn toward perhaps a more Indonesia-like system. Um, and for the Malay majority, even by the end, the candidate's poll far outpaced that of party or prime minister. And younger voters as well were especially prone to look to the candidate, regardless of ethnicity, or issues over party. So party loyalty is clearly at a low ebb. On the eve of the election, the biggest winner in surveys for who they would vote for was none of the above or on the fence, entailing a mad chase after the elusive swing vote, this in the strong party state of Southeast Asia. The shift in support from BN to PN in particular, since more of PN support came from there, suggests fungibility of support or voting for a communal party, but not necessarily one specific communal party. And among candidates, the optimal strategy for party hoppers, of whom there were many, um, successful only for some though, was to de-emphasize their party altogether, to urge their voters explicit, explicitly to vote for the person and never mind their party. Those developments signal that UMNO cannot hope to drift or lurch back to the dominant party status quo ante. That said, their kingmaker status in the coalition has amplified UMNO's power and position well beyond what voters seem to have intended in rejecting the party. So BN, mostly UMNO, um, three of their three seats are from their partners, or of their 30 seats. Um, BN is in the unusual position of being a self-proclaimed progressive alternative, at least vis-a-vis -vis PN or PAS. They're helped in that framing by some really overtly racist and inflammatory rhetoric from PAS and Versatu. And while the MIC and MCA are clearly no stronger than they've been in a long time, Grakan was basically just a garnish. For, for PN, it's, it's all but wiped out at the federal level. So PN makes no claim to multiracial representation. So this could be a moment for democratic change, for internal reform and renewal that UMNO failed to pursue in 2018. But no. It may yet be that Zahid's and others' court cases for corruption, 1MDB, all that jazz, run their course and yield convictions. But for now, Zahid has successfully ensured that the top two posts in UMNO, his own and that of his deputy, Mat Hassan, will be uncontested. And he's purged his key rivals just what, last week, I think, um, in the party. So he's been helped in that effort by the fact of electoral losses among some key progressive voices or reformist voices in the party like Hari Jamaluddin and Shahril Hamdan, who are now presumably mulling plan Bs. So beyond parties, several dimensions of political culture and norms also warrant highlighting. I'll say less about these, um, including ones for which effects or patterns are fairly ambiguous or ambivalent. So first, most importantly, um, and it fits nicely as a segue from the last panel, um, racial or communal politics. The Agong, the king, pressed for a more inclusive coalition than the near exclusively Bumiputra government that Mohidin had proposed for, for Prikatan. But the campaign and its aftermath math saw a really stark escalation of racial and ethno-nationalist rhetoric and tropes. And those tensions haven't vanished just because the king insisted on a coalition. The fact of so heavily social media oriented a campaign made it all the easier for inflammatory messages to spread. Um, for the record, we had a survey with Merdeka Center only 15% of Malays and 7% of Chinese respondents to our survey thought they had encountered fake news. That's, that's just wrong. They're delusional. Okay, and only 2% said that they were not sure. So they're very certain in that, which is scary. But the fact remains that PN seems to have written off the non-Malay vote altogether, notwithstanding Grakan, having decided it was worth the cost of alienating non-Malays who might otherwise have been... Um, Wooable for the sake of emphasizing a Malay Muslim niche. 
So there's potential for the ruling coalition, especially inclusive as it is of East Malaysia, to tamp down some of that rhetoric and debunk some vilifying myths. And in particular that UMNO is working with the DAP, this Chinese-based party, now much more multiracial than in the past, that will make it harder to continue branding the DAP as communist Islamophobes, at least logically, and logic doesn't always carry the day. At the same time, UMNO now gains and claims a special stature, despite its few seats, as a bulwark against a PN green wave. So it could emphasize its malayness all the more. And there's a question of what extent or character of Islamism voters want. Trends do suggest increasing support for PAS and political Islam among younger Malay voters in particular, though Merdeka Center data, again, at least, suggests that PAS's share of the vote increased sharply in 1999, the Reformasi election, um, but has remained largely stable ever since. And again, we can't read all support for PN, especially Bursatu, as a proactive call or mandate for Islamization beyond Malay ethno-nationalism. But even the latter, nationalism, as we've just heard, is not super healthy for a multiracial would-be democracy. Though a related issue, given their Malay communal, but also not so democratic aspect, is the political role of the sultans. There seems a wide acceptance now of a clearly expanded, more overt role for the Agong, the king especially. At issue is not just certifying the choice of prime minister and state uh, Mentri Bissar, chief ministers, nor even tallying legislators' statutory declarations about whom they'll support, but actually ordering the coalitions back to the negotiating table and picking the winner. On the other hand, we might consider policies, however large communal dimensions loom. Economics really dominated campaign rhetoric. Costs of living, inflation, economic growth or development, and social welfare were voters' primary concerns, just some different nuances by ethnicity of which of those issues people prioritized. Next was Malay rights for Malay respondents and racial equity for non-Malay respondents. But that was mostly a second order concern and it was mostly among non-Malays, not Malays. So it's safe to assume that if this government does nothing else, which may indeed be the case, they will at least dole out payments where and when they can. It's worth noting how deeply a discourse of poverty and need, not in ethnic terms, but in terms of socioeconomic strata, references to the B40, the lower 40%, has permeated over the last 10 years or so. This was a Najib agenda, which, which actually is stuck. So BN's manifesto even adopted this ostensibly class-based rather than race-based framing. The, the manifesto does not say Bumiputra, it says B40. That recentering aligns with and with, was furthered by a focus on youth, and the straightened economic opportunities and social mobility that they confront. The campaign saw some quite inclusive messaging that implicitly or explicitly highlighted the extent to which economic priorities affect all youth regardless of race. In that vein, we also saw a high premium placed on youth candidates, even though they were only a minority. So rhetoric aside, lots of talk about youth, 27% of 945 candidates total were over 60. 16% were under 40 and only 2% were under 30. So a lot of it just empty rhetoric. But younger candidates did tend to stress their age as an advantage, even as older ones stress their experience. And likewise, that same sort of rhetoric reality, um, young women emphasized both gender and age, but only a still unimpressive cross age groups, 13.4% of candidates were women. And women's representation in parliament has actually declined slightly to 14%, uh, 31 seats. So to conclude, backsliding, stasis, or just wobbling, which is uh, the best characterization I've come up so, with so far from Malaysia of the wobble. Um, so the single biggest sign that perhaps we'll see reconsolidation toward the illiberal end of a democratic continuum comes, or of a regime continuum, comes from within UMNO, not the GE proper. So that's Zahid's success in consolidating his grip. Yet still ahead are six of 13 state elections that haven't been held yet. They need to be held by the middle of this year, especially given the UMNO purge, it, that could really have an impact. So Pakatan and the BN are making plans to coordinate, to collaborate um, in terms of seats. Zahid's power play is certainly a sign of deep resistance to reform and an anti-democratic set of inclinations, but UMNO could well be routed even more in the state elections than in GE15 and now has the power to drag Pakatan down with it. That is not to say, that a, a Prikatan, a PN administration, would necessarily be notably less liberal than a PHBN plus administration, the current one. But it would 
be less representative, certainly. It's not so clear that Versace's Muhyiddin, rather than Hadia Wang or another POS leader, would emerge as PN if they took over the federal government. And there's little to indicate any strong inclination toward progressive policies, even if there's at least hopefully less tolerance for corruption than in UMNO. So the precise coalition now in office is, of course, unprecedented. But there were glimmerings. Since Reformasi, there has been a stark division between the set of parties now known as Pakatan and BN. Yet Anwar is from UMNO. In fact, a whole lot of these characters are from UMNO. What's now Ka'adilan was not all that different from Bursatu, albeit with non-Malays, also front and center. Some of those, the early joiners, all of them, were dropped from contesting this time because they were in the wrong faction within Anwar's party. And today's Pakatan had previous iterations that suggest how fundable these alliances could be, most obviously the on and off relationship with PAS. So more recently, there's Ismail Sabri's BN-led administration propped up by an MOU with Pakatan. All parties then recognized a common interest in moving forward, establishing and maintaining a functioning government, stabilizing the economy, addressing COVID, not again proroguing parliament for months, and at least some mutually agreeable institutional reforms. That experience set the stage for a new twist now on that agreement, whether with a CSA-backed minority coalition, which was touted, or a quirky majority coalition, which we have. And Ismail Sabri's administration did achieve some meaningful institutional reforms, which might give us hope, including an anti-hopping law that at least constrained the options for which MPs might cohere how to form a government. Yeah. But I'll conclude what this government might do as a lens on whether we should expect a progressive or regressive turn. Overall, the chief objective all around really does seem to be merely staying in office. In terms of stability, this government might last through to the next election, if only for lack of a clearly viable alternative and that helpful law against hopping. But even if it does, we can assume that parties share of support and the effective number of parties, again, jargon, sorry, could well shift quite a bit next time around, especially since it's anyone's guess whether Pakatan and BN will contest separately or together. So long-term stability, setting aside democracy remains a question. Malaysia's first past the post single member district voting rules will encourage a return to a two party system or two coalitions, which will reinforce party system stability. But then again, more choice and less predictable winners, what we have now, that may signal a healthier democracy in some respects. Having an overly rigid party system and a strong from the outset BN has arguably impeded institutional innovation and reform over the years. Now, the lack of a securely dominant party means all parties might finally see similar value in institutional reforms useful for better governance, accountability, fiscal probity, and so forth, lest some other parties secure advantages that keep them secure. Just as plausible, though, is immobility, that no party sees an advantage in clipping their own wings as by enacting meaningful campaign finance regulations or term limits or a more empowered upper, upper house, for instance. So all told, for now, we can only wait and see. Sorry. Malaysian democracy is neither advancing nor declining, but movement in either direction is equally plausible. <laughs> I think I can give a trigger warning. Um, this is not going to be a talk to me thing. As, as, as yours. Um, so when I was asked to speak about the drivers of democratic decline, I just remembered I've been talking about democratic decline, democratic dysfunction, democratic demise, democratic decay for about 30, 30 years. Aside from, I like the alliteration, especially this panel, the drivers of democratic decline. Um, it was to me those phrases reflect the reality I was seeing, and maybe it's because I'm a journalist and hardwired to be pessimistic, but also reflected the reality that I and my generation of journalists, activists, um, scholars, um, civil society, whatever in Southeast Asia were seeing. You know, we're seeing more dark than light in the way our democracy was progressing. And of course, it turns out other people were not seeing that way. At any rate, um, was it um, Marx famously said that the seeds of capitalism were contained um, at birth? 
I think you could say he has yet to be proven right. Um, but the seeds of democracy of democratic decline were certainly, I think, as in the case of the Philippines, were sown at birth. Um, there's a lot of recent commentary. I know a lot of you are familiar with Rodrigo Duterte, um, the rise of populist auto autocrats in the Philippines and elsewhere, and Duterte being part of that global trend. But Duterte did not begin did not start the process of democratic decline in the Philippines. Duterte was instead a product of that decline. Um, he did hasten the decline and made a Marcos restoration possible, a restoration of the Marcos family in power by mocking the ineffectiveness and effeteness of the liberal elites, especially when it came to addressing crime and corruption. He also emasculated the checks on power by uh, you know, harassing the press, politicizing the courts, emasculating the political opposition, and clamping down on the human rights and good governance um, NGOs. His rise to power was actually due to the weakness of democracy. Democracy was already weak when he came to power in 2016. He just executed um, hopefully not the final blow, but he executed a severe blow on, on, on democracy. So um, let's start with 1986 when we had what we call the Edsa Revolution. Other people call their popular uprisings after flowers or after colors. We called ours after a strip of highway. Possibly it's because we spend so much time in Manila traffic. But the revolution in Edsa was, was an was a, not really, didn't start out to be an uprising, it was an aborted coup. And that has something to do with what happened afterwards. It was a faction of the military that was anti-Marcos that wanted to unseat him and install him in power. That coup failed, it was discovered and it gave rise to an uprising on the streets of Manila, a three day uprising that ended with Marcos being flown away on board two US army helicopters to exile in Honolulu, the entire, the entire family. So that was uh, what came to power after those three days was an unwieldy and, un and unsustainable coalition that included a hawkish and empowered military faction bent on, if not grabbing power, being the dominant force in the post-Marcos coalition. It also included the traditional political oligarchy that had been in power for several generations, dating back to the Philippine Revolution against Spain in 1896, um, the Aquino and Laurel families, Aquino being the president and Laurel the vice president, and also a section of middle class reformers, um, the church, big business, and a faction sympathetic to the national democratic left. So this coalition could not possibly last, and it didn't. But the constitution that that coalition gave birth to um, in 1986 or 87, did have progressive elements. It provided for human rights protections, the rights of indigenous peoples, a party list system that would give representation to underrepresented sectors of uh, society, and a ban on political dynasties, which is what we call political families. But basically, the post EDSA system resurrected the status quo before Marcos, it decentralized political power partly a reaction to Marcos's centralization of political power in the presidency, but it gave polit devolved political power to local governments and therefore local officials, therefore local political clans. And it also instituted a bicameral legislature, a Senate that's nationally elected, and the House of Representatives that's elected by district in a first-past-the-post system. The problem was at that time there was no, and even up to now, there were no established political parties except for the Communist Party of the Philippines, which did engage in electoral politics, but was mainly um, interested in armed struggle and overthrowing the state. So in this political vacuum, political families rather than political parties became the primary vehicle for electoral contestation. And this was already obvious in the first elections after the fall of Marcos in 1987 and in 1988. 
over the years, these political families maneuvered to ensure their dominance. And over time, the progressive elements of the Constitution and the checks and balances to power provided for in the Constitution were eroded. The ban on political dynasties was never legislated, so never really put into effect. The party list system was emasculated and instead of providing representation for underrepresented sectors of society was actually became a back, actually became a backdoor for political families to get to power. So the result was almost predictable. Perhaps we should have seen it there in the intoxicating night of February 25th, 1986, but it was an oligarchy of wealth and power. The family, families used their elective positions to keep themselves in public office and advance their and their allies' economic interests. It was the same thing we had in the post-war, pre-Marcus, pre-dictatorship era. Then, as now, this system was hounded by scandals, massive corruption, allegation of electoral fraud, human rights abuses that made citizens cynical about democratic politics, especially as a weak justice system were unable to hold power holders accountable and to rein in the abuses of power. Competitive elections did succeed in stabilizing the system. It dom they domesticated the unruly elements of society through elections, for example, the military coups, which were problems in the first three years of the Aquino government. Uh, the military were then went back to barracks and went out and campaigned for public office. The Marcoses, who funded the, some of the coups in 1986, 1987, and 1989, ended up giving up and saying, we're going to go back and contest public office. They were allowed back in 1991. In 1992, Imelda Marcos ran for president. And after that, she and her children contested public office and later national office. They twigged early on that the route to power was not through coup d'etats, but through elections, a game they knew how to play. So um, the last coup was in 1989, although we did have incidents of military adventurism. In 2003, for example, a band of military rebels smashed an armored personal vehicle in a five-star hotel. Our military mutineers love five-star hotels. Um, but, but that was kind of the end of it. After these misadventures, the military rebels ran for public office. Several of them are in the Senate or in the House of Representatives. In fact, the challenges to the stability of elected regimes came apart from the military and for insurgencies and terrorism, especially in the South, came from the EDSA constituency, the church, the middle class, um, some sections of business who staged uprisings, which were extra legal efforts to oust popularly elected, but sadly corrupt presidents. In 2001, Joseph Estrada, in another attempt in 2006, when there was an aborted, what is called a coup come uprising, which is a very Philippine thing, mm -hmm. um, a hybrid coup plus popular uprising, uh, failed in 2006. Um, these uprisings arose mainly from the frustration, from the failures of democratic institutions to hold presidents to account. And so um, coups and uprisings were seen as plausible shortcuts to accountability. Um, but now we know better. We know that after nearly 40 years, electoralism has failed to build a viable democracy and has failed to address longstanding problems of Philippine society, including the, most of all, the inclusivity of our political system. To be fair, you know, we do have an oligarchy, but it's a rather open oligarchy. It's open to newcomers, or who show both an entrepreneurial talent in both business and politics. Prime example of this is Manny Villar. He's the second richest man in the country. His net worth, according to Forbes, is something like $8 billion, which puts him up there. But it's not from the traditional Spanish and Chinese mestizo elite, but using both, you know, his entrepreneurial talents as well as a lot of government concessions in order to reach the commanding heights of both power and wealth. So it's really a less and less inclusive society on the political front. We have the consolidation of the rule of political families, 
in um, 2019 to 2014, the Senate before these, 14 of 24 senators belong to political clans, so that's more than half. In 2022, the Senate that was elected last year, it's the same thing, still 14 of 24, but these senators represented increasingly fewer political clans. So we have two sets of siblings, um, two Cayetanos, two Ejercitos, one mother and son, the aforementioned Mr. Villar, his wife and his son are in the Senate, and Juan Marcos, the sister of the current president. So it's, it's really dynastic rule, the essence of dynastic rule. Um, in the previous house, we don't have, I don't have the count for the current house, 162 of 304 members came from political families and 60 of 81 governors are from political clans. I'll go down the road, but you get, but you get the drift. 40 governors, we have 72 pro or 73 provinces. 40 of them are led by officials who are related to members of the House of Representatives, right? So I will not belabor the point, um, but I would like to point out that in this sense, the Marcos family is very normal and exemplify the consolidation of family power. Their use of local office to then uh, get, gain national office. So in the Philippines, as a journalist, I drew a lot of family trees because that was one way to understand the society. So let's go to Bongbong Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. His sister, Aimi, is senator and head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The president's son, Sandro, is deputy speaker of the house and representative of the first district of Ilocos Norte, which is the Marcos home province. His cousin, Angelo Barba, there are two congressional districts in Ilocos Norte, is representative of the second district. So that's a province where virtually there's no political opposition. I mean Marcos's son, so you'll get lost, I should have drawn this, um, the president's sister's son, is the governor of Ilocos Norte, the home province. The president's cousin, Ferdinand Martin Romualde, so this is the Imelda Marcos side of the family. They come from Leyte. He represents one of the congressional districts in Leyte. He is speaker of the house. Martin's wife, Yeda Marie Romualdez, a former Miss International, very important to Filipinos, um, former later representative, is now a party list representative um, representing an underrepresented sector of people who live in, in the Eastern Visayas region. So this political exclusivity is matched by um, profound inequality at the economic level. About, um, we have about 114 million Filipinos right now. We're growing very fast. About 11 million of those live below the power of the poverty line. But for me, the most important section of this population, and to me is the base of populism in the Philippines, is two thirds of this population, those who live between, who have monthly incomes of between $600 to $1,000, they comprise about 70 million of the 114 million. They are the base for populist politics. Their desire is for discipline and stability. They are tired of democratic dysfunction, they are hopeless that reforms are possible under the system, but they pin their hopes on overseas work or employment in the country's overseas migration, overseas remittances, and um, BPOs, business process outsourcing, are the main drivers of the political economy and the major sources of foreign exchange and account for a huge chunk of, the, of, of our GDP. They pin their hopes on advancement in those two sectors. They are in effect the underclass of the global economy. They are not the poorest of the poor, but they feel they can claw their way out of poverty through individual efforts and through family networks, not through social change. Very different from the 1960s, 70s and 80s, when people went to the streets or went underground or to the mountains to demand political change. They are resentful of liberal elites and they're sermonizing about democracy and good governance. 
this deep, profound dissatisfaction with liberal democracy made the country ripe for a populist takeover. It was only a matter of time before somebody like Duterte would assume office and deploy the arsenal of modern day autocrats, um, you know, spin dictators, famous the title of a book, using disinformation, control of the media, the harassment of independent and critical voices, nonstop propaganda, but also violence against human rights lawyers, journalists, environmental defenders, doctors, et cetera, et cetera. They, Duterte, as people said, also weakened the, the checks in power. And they also mocked, you know, sort of the civil society discourse that became dominant in the Philippines and in many other countries in Southeast Asia back in the 90s, M mocked civil society and their sort of moralizing about dem democracy and human rights. Um, his hardline approach to dissent also in effect marginalized the CPP and its allied organizations and everyone else fighting for social, for social reforms. Um, this system is remarkably resilient. Very sad to say, partly because the Philippines is uh, protected from economic headwinds because of its reliance not on the domestic economy, but on overseas remittances and on BPO revenues for its economy to survive. There is no impetus for our elites to reform the economy, to make it a more even playing field. Again, that was the discourse of the 1990s when Ramos crack down and monopolies, et cetera. There is no impetus for them because they can make so much money from uh, what somebody who studied the real estate industry called the new sharecroppers. And the new sharecroppers are the migrant workers who buy the condominiums, um, shop in the shopping malls, and avail themselves of, the, of all the services in, uh, of, of the economy that's mainly grows mainly to them. GDP increased by 7.6% in 2022, the strongest since 1976. It's an economy that Bong Bong Marcos is presiding over. Um, it's deeply unequal, but resilient because of the safety valves of overseas migration, thanks to the global economy that still uses Philippine labor when you're computer is down, it's likely a Filipino who will answer the line at the other end. Am I over time? Okay, so what can be done? Um, I was talking to some people who are in the political opposition and they said, maybe we have to wait 18 years to be back in power. 18 because it's six years of this Marcos. The next six years will be probably Sara Duterte, who's the vice president, President Duterte's daughter, so that's 12 years. And the third year may probably be another Marcos or another Duterte. So their timeline is 18 years. So what do we do in this 18, in this 18 years cycle? So a lot of people, really the Marcos restoration has kind of wakened up civil society from its kind of delusions or stupor and realized that all that organizing, all that community organizing, they feel betrayed by the people they've organized, including those, you know, in, in poor communities and fishers and peasants and urban poor. But they realize how far they were from the real sentiments of the people they thought were with them, but really were not. And so this realization is sparing a lot of very intense, I was in the Philippines over the winter holiday, winter break, and I saw a lot of intense thinking, not so much acting, but really a lot of intense examination of where is it that the social movements that were so strong, 70s and 80s, and even in 90s, where did they go wrong? There are no answers, but among the things that I was hearing was one, uh, going back to the grassroots and participating in local politics, doing change at the local level rather than at the national level. Um, most of the NGOs are right now in survival mode, but also talking about using different language, not the language of rights, which was prevalent back in the day, but which were undermined. But, you know, maybe the language of empathy, 
or listening more. I don't know. It's all very fuzzy right now, but I don't have time. We can talk about that later. But this is a period rather than of action, but of intense reflection and thinking. What have we done wrong in the past 40 years or the next 20 years going to look like? Thank you. Here again, I'm prom I promise this is the last time today. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Meredith and Sheila have talked extensively about what's going on respectively in Malaysia, in the Philippines. So I'm going to keep my uh, presentation short and I'm, I'm just going to quote big names here. So, you know, so I'm safe. <laughs> no. Uh, no, actually, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to focus on the factors that might have caused a democratic regression in Indonesia. And um, Sheila, when you mentioned you've been talking about this for 30 years, I remember it hasn't been that long for us. When ANU announced the topic of the 2019 Indonesia update was from democratic stagnation to regression, that created a huge outcry and they got quite a criticism about that. Um, but now, you know, only a few years later, now every day we have a TV dialogue, a webinar, seminar about democratic decline in Indonesia. So it's becoming mainstream to speak about that. Um, even though, you know, observers disagree as to what's actually going on in Indonesia. So for example, Bifitri Susanti said what, what we're seeing is like in, you know, other places like Hungary when it's autocratic legalism. That is when populist leaders use their, use their democratic mandates to launch legal reforms to remove checks and balances on executive powers. And so uh, she said, we can see evidence for this. For example, the uh, the new law on anti-corruption body that I mentioned earlier, you know, the weakening uh, of, of the anti-corruption body, bringing it under the executive control. And then um, the fact, for example, that recently the chief constitutional judge who rejected the omnibus law was reprimanded and then removed by the House of Representatives. So that, you know, interference in judicial uh, uh, independency uh, that is becoming another sign of this autocratic legalism. Um, and then the new penal code, the criminal code, uh, which, uh, you know, it has a lot of prob problematic provisions in it. Uh, but I think the biggest one that's been criticized is, is that the uh, it curbs the freedom of press uh, and, and assembly. So, for example, insulting government and the symbol of state is a punishable crime up to four years. Um, so it's, you know the, the the this penal code is not going to take effect until three years uh, three years time, uh, but it it remains you know a very dangerous tool for anyone uh, to use later, even though you know some might argue that Jokowi is not uh, an authoritarian person, but you know the the tools are there and have been sponsored uh, and and enabled by his government. Um, so and then another opinion, for example, Marcus Mitzner went further saying that we are seeing democratic deconsolidation. So at all levels, representative level, the inclusiveness uh, and uh, at the constitutional level, at the civic value, civil society level, um, you know, in terms of the veto powers like the military, Sydney will tell you more about this, uh, uh, the, this militarization and everything. Um, so not militarization, but, you know, just the increasing role of the military in civic, uh, in civil affairs. Um, so that's one argument for democratic uh, deconsolidation. I think you can name it whatever you want, but um, I'm just going to talk about the, I think, the three factors that are often mentioned. Uh, one is structural, and then second factor has to do with Jokowi's own pers uh, personality or what he's done. And then the, the last one, um, I think this is something that is closest to me, which is the enfeebling of civil society. Uh, so on the structural factors, uh, of course, socioeconomic inequality, wealth inequality is a big problem. Now, Indonesia, I think, is ranked, uh, according to Oxfam, is ranked sixth in the most, uh, you know, uh, country with most uh, wealth uh, inequality in the world. Um, so that's a problem in itself, but also even more so when it's exploited and weaponized by populist politicians in order to in intensify social cleavages, especially in a place like Indonesia, when wealth inequality and ethnicity and religion are closely interlinked, you know, the rich Chinese versus poor Pribumi. Uh, and so that, that kind of thing remains uh, a challenge uh, from the structural point of view. And then there's the existence of veto players, the military, 
And then I think another source of structural weakness is that Indonesia's democratization was not solely achieved through social movement or people power, like in the Philippines, but also there is an aspect of authoritarian bargaining. Uh, then Slater has an interesting term for this. It was the, the odd parenting that gave birth to reformasi was not this, the student movement, but also the old ruling elites that decided to just, okay, we lose power, but we will get new ones in the democratic system. Um, so as a result, uh, now most of the political parties in Indonesia are led by those old elites, whether from the military elites or the business oligarchs. Uh, and, and at first, these elites quietly manipulated the democratic rule of the game uh, to their favor, but increasingly they're employing a more uh, crude uh, methods to roll back democratization like that, you know, Volker, you know, saying that, you know, we want to postpone the election. Um, so that's the structural problems. And then moving on to the second one, you know, something that to do with Jokowi himself. Now there is, you know, a debate whether or not Jokowi is really like an Orban or Erdogan. I don't think so. I don't think he's even like Suharto. Um, um, not as sultanistic, at least, even though his sons are not trying to get political power as well. Uh, um, I Look, uh, I think Thomas Carroll has said you know, something, we coined the term, uh, what is it, opportunistic authoritarian, so accidental <laughs> authoritarian. I think Jokowi is probably closer to that terminology because, you know, when he first came to power, you know, there's a lot of hope uh, that he will be the savior of democracy. And indeed, he came up with ideas for reforms, mostly economic reforms and infrastructural uh, development rather than democratic uh, reforms. But I don't think he was ever intent on becoming an autocrat. Um, but when he came to power, he was faced with a parliament that is dominated by the opposition parties. Uh, uh, who tried to cancel a direct election at the local level. And he was also powerless in his own party, the PDIP. Um, so it is these early insecurities that led him to weaken parliamentary opposition, both through promiscuous power sharing and also, uh, also through uh, sheer intimidation. So Marcus Mitzner called this a cause of coalition building. So for example, he uh, Jokowi exploits internal friction within each opposition party and then manipulate the judicial processes such that the pro-government faction within each party uh, uh, can win uh, at the rightful claimant of the party leadership, whereas the anti-Jokowi party leaders are ostracized from their own party. Um, and that is how he got rid of meaningful opposition in the House of Representatives. Um, and then the second element of Jokowi's illiberalism, I think his toxic can-do attitude. You know, economic reforms come uh, at all expenses and he uh, he's so single-minded in his developmentalist goals uh, that he's willing to take constitutional questionable shortcuts and sacrifice civic freedom for the sake of uh, stability and development. We saw this, you know, when there was that 2016 mobilization and then he... Uh, had he replaced uh, the minister of um, what is it, the Paul Hukam, of uh, the coordinating minister for political and security affairs to Wiranto, which is you know the old uh, another retired general from the Suharto era, because he believed that only someone like a strong person like that can restore the stability, and you know be firm against Islamist movements. Um, and then you know the recent passage of the omnibus law, as I mentioned. <laughs> twice already. There's also another clear sign of incremental attack on uh, judicial uh, independence. You know, after that law was rejected by the constitutional court, the government just said, okay, uh, we now we issue an emergency decree. That's not the same as, as law. But So, um, you know, they just find ways to, uh, to, to make possible the economic reforms, like the, the building of the new capital city and so on. Um, and then certainly from the civil society, look, I think this is, people often say that maybe the, say, the, the saving grace for Indonesian democracy is the vibrant uh, civil society. Uh, but uh, even then is now, uh, we can't take it for granted anymore because it's also facing different challenges. Polarization, co-optation, and the low mobilizing power, especially of the liberal civil society groups. Uh, on polarization, I already mentioned previously, you know, the polarization of civil society along this Islamist pluralist divide undermines their role to some extent as the defender of liberal democracy. 
many uh, CSOs genuinely believe that defending religious pluralism automatically amounts to safeguarding democracy, which is true to some extent. But the fear of Islamist inroads, uh, Islamist uh, victory, is so paralyzing that it kind of crippled their liberal sensibilities to an extent, leading some of them to turn a blind eye to the blatant assaults on civil rights. Uh, for example, you know, some of the pluralist civil society groups justify the extrajudicial killing of six Islamist members, saying that the police have done the right thing, even though the National Commission of Human Rights itself, uh, the, in their investigation, found that it was indeed extrajudicial uh, shootings uh, by the police. And then there's the pro-militant uh, social media influencers, you know, doing online doxing and hate speech against the Islamists, uh, peoples of uh, Arab um, descendants, especially Anis Baswedan, calling them desert lizards or camel or whatever. Um, so, um, and then if, if, you know, when, when they got, when someone, you know, you know, that doesn't sound right, is it? Uh, and, and they would say, well, we just want the Islamists to taste, uh, to have a taste of their own medicine. Um, but of course, not all civil society are like that. There are still civil society groups that remain vocal and critical towards the creeping authoritarianism but they also uh, face some problems. One is cooptation. I think everyone knows now that many, uh, several former rights activists have joined the government, I, for example, as members of the presidential advisory board or, or other in other capacities. Um, and I'm sure they all have good intentions, you know, changing the system from within and whatnot. Um, but also, but I think they've also been instrumental in justifying some of the more draconian policies uh, using nice sounding rights language. Um, and, and, and the second problem is, is, is that the liberal opposition don't have strong enough mass base um, or maybe not yet able to sustain it. Uh, so labor and student movement, just to mention a few. The labor movement, uh, I don't know, like the, the loudest labor union right now has been co-opted somewhat since the government allowed them to establish a new political party just this year. So, and then there's another problem, the, the, the what is it, the KPU, the, electro, the Electoral Commission uh, only approved a few, is it four new parties? And they're either uh, a splinter of the existing opposition party, so you know what, what it's aimed for, and the other the, the 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 other party is the Labour Party, and and it's the most focal Labour group actually, um, and and so from the student movement, which is so iconic in Indonesia because you know they're often credited for the success of the reformasi in 1998, um, and the largest protest that they organized uh, recently in, was in 2019 and 2020. But since then, you know, because of COVID, um, they haven't been able to sustain the movement because the universities were closed, students were sent home, e-learning, just staying from home. So they haven't been able to get resources or new recruits to sustain uh, the movement. And also there's co-optation of some student movement as well. Um, so like it or not, Islamists are now probably the uh, only extra parliamentary opposition they still consistently organize protests with a decent turnout, not huge, but a, sub, a substantial and loyal base that, that they have. Um, and uh, someone asked this question at the CFR conference yesterday, you know, what about a possible alliance between Islamist and liberal opposition or groups or civil society? They have been trying to do that, um, you know, with Anis, by supporting Anis, for example, but so far, it hasn't it hasn't really come through yet. One, I think the liberal intelligentsia, civil uh, sorry, uh, student groups, are just wary of aligning themselves with you know intolerant groups, um, and and um, you know this uh, they they because they perceive the Islamists as ultra conservative hate mongers, um, and the government also played this up very nicely. So the government would dismiss student protests by saying that oh you've been infiltrated by Islamists. Uh, so that's another reason uh, for the hesitant, uh, hesitancy to create a coalition of uh, different civil society groups. Uh, so you get the picture, you can make your own conclusion. Uh, but let me just say that while well, Indonesia probably fares relatively better than Myanmar or some other countries, but the democratic erosion, I think, is going on in a much faster rate than before. Thank you. All three were fantastic. Thank you very much. And we're open for questions. We have 20 minutes. Ah, 
Hey, uh, thanks y'all for speaking. I uh, appreciate everyone coming out. Um, my name is Bing An. I'm an intern with NYCN. Um, So I actually had a question for Sheila in particular. Uh, I appreciated your comment about the idea using like Marx's uh, quote about the idea that like the seeds for the defeat of democracy were sown into its like fundamental inception. Um, because I think like one of the thoughts on my mind throughout like this whole, like while speaking on this topic or hearing these uh, talks is the idea that like, it almost seems like these issues, like the even the like the phrase the decline of democracy is interesting to me because it almost seems like this is just democracy dealing with problems that it itself brought about. Like it's not like these problems are external to democracy, but rather democracy allowed them to like flourish and it consistently does in different cases and seems to be doing that globally at this point. So I almost want to approach it from the systematic kind of angle, like less like can we save democracy and more like is democracy sustainable as a system? Is this do like is, is it a political system that works? Because it seems like globally it's not, and it seems like this is like a repeated kind of point it reaches, uh, it hits. Um, and you had actually mentioned the Communist Party in the Philippines, and I was wondering if you'd speak to that further because um, I don't think there's a lot of people who are ready or willing to wait for a 16 year timeline. Uh, less, you know, we have global issues approaching as well. There's like international issues. Everything is so pressing and urgent. Um, I imagine the kind of immediacy of revolution now would be a really appealing slogan for people who are absolutely on the brink. Um, so in that capacity, I was wondering, do you think that like uh, different uh, parties who are hoping to kind of push a liberal line or, you know, democratic at, at this kind of broad term, do you think they actually have a chance? Um, like, do you think that's realistic that, uh, they're going to be able to uh, kind of uh, push for that kind of a project in the face of kind of this evidence that it hasn't worked for so long. Um, and if you could speak a bit to again to the how uh, the com if the communist uh, party, you know, if that is like an alternative at this moment, or if there's other alternatives that look um, appealing besides them and the um, Duterte camp. I appreciate it. Thank you. So we'll talk more in the next session about insurgency and counterinsurgency, but the Communist Party of the Philippines was founded in 1968. So it's an aging party and its leaders, still the same leaders. I mean, Jose Maria Season died recently, but it's an but it's it's um gent it's a gentocracy. And 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 the language it uses still dates back to the Maoist era, you know, very, very old fashioned red guard kind of race clenched fist. It still has a following. It's a very small following, but it lost a lot of that following when democracy was restored in 1986, because then people wanted to give democracy a chance. They didn't think armed struggle was necessary because there were all of these channels for expressing dissent and working for social reforms. Of course, they were disappointed. But during that time, the CPP didn't gather strength, it lost a lot of strength. And I think now the agenda of the military dating back to the Duterte era and even the Marcos era is to completely crush the Communist Party. Right now they're on the defensive. There's been a number of extrajudicial killings. Their founder is dead. The second line leadership is either old or is probably dead. There are rumors of drone strikes that have struck the second line leadership of the Communist Party. It's kind of lost right now, and I think it will probably disintegrate into small regional armed groups and not be able to sustain anything at the national level. Yeah. So there's no call for revolution in the Philippines. There's a call to go overseas. That's where the, the dissent is going. They're so sick and tired of this system. Let's find a way out. Conrad, let's get you through. Would you pick that slide in there? Thank you. All these countries are, as far as I know, parliamentary democracy. And obviously, we know that with that. as well as from a lack of structured opposition on the sort of party level or at the national level. And so based on that, I was wondering whether or not you see sort of that structural or this idea of like a strong sector, right? Like yes, don't want a proxy, but maybe for like some citizens and voters, like yeah, like obviously you want to pick public, but in the face of you know such 
inefficiencies of corruption, it's better having this in the small. All that is so this week is the success of Singapore, right? Like, maybe, and um, yesterday CFR, someone mentioned it was Singapore and me, right? Well, can we be the university? I was wondering where you're going to go back to the classroom. Where is it? Meredith, just like a specific question. Um, you, you mentioned Fulton. Mm -hmm. um, it seems you just put me into what a development sort of like what the previous time went on did. Um, I don't want to think about it. So, because okay. uh, so if you can go back to politics, mm -hmm. you're Okay, uh, good questions. Um, so I will, uh, one correction to that is that these are not all parliamentary democracies, but Malaysia is, um, or not yet. I mean, maybe it's still to come. <laughs> yeah. But for now, for now, that still could change, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so it's an interesting dynamic in as much as, uh, and I'll come back to the Sultan question, so remind me if I forget. Um, so there has been in the past executive centralization in Malaysia that has been part and parcel of a strong party system. So in other words, it's been that the strength of UMNO within, and the strength of the BN, which is basically UMNO, has been intrinsically tied to the strength of the executive as prime minister. The president of UMNO was prime minister of Malaysia. That, that link severed with the new configuration under Ismail Sabri. And that's part of, you know, some of the discussion before the election was that even if things didn't go well for, you know, whoever you were talking to, um, that still there could be a less powerful executive because there was an example of that. And because you had the party president who was the one who would give the, it's called the Surat Watika, the, the letter of, that nominates somebody to stand in a seat. That was up to Zahid, even though he wasn't the prime minister, except for a couple of people, he didn't give any of Ismail Sabri's cabinet, his followers, uh, seats to contest. Um, and those are, you know, some of the names that were just ousted. Those are some of Ismail Sabri's people. Um, and so there was this interesting potential for a weaker executive. And that I think has happened. But it's not necessarily a question of institutional strengthening that has allowed that, but rather the deinstitutionalization of strong parties that has taken with it the overly strong executive. I'm not sure if I'm explaining that well, but that, that's really how I see it. Um, so much of, this is something I wrote about years ago and, and I think is for the most part held until now, um, now it's gone. But um, that because if you think about the sort of, you know, Martin Schefter and so forth, these theories of the ways that states and civil societies, or states and bureaucracies develop, state bureaucracies and parties develop, sorry. Um, Malaysia was the reverse of a lot of places. You had the development of a strong party system with strong parties, both government and opposition. So Malaysia has had coherent, strong, reified opposition parties from the 1950s, from independents like PAS and the DAP. Um, but that developed really before the development of a really strong state, the bureaucracy. And so that also then, because you had a dominant party system, you had UMNO, the BN in control for C Alliance and BN since independence, you had a, a civil, a, a bureaucracy, sorry, I keep saying civil society, <laughs> civil servants, civil service, um, that was um, really umbilically tied to UMNO for that whole time. And so there's a really, there's one really good book on this, uh, Hide Kune Washida uh, from Waseda University. He wrote the one book I know of on this. It's great. Really looking at decision-making within the bureaucracy and how much they didn't need to be pulled by UMNO. They just, uh, that was, that's what they grew up under. That's what they knew. And so part of the difficulty of change since then has been trying to institutionalize a state that's separate from the parties. And so it's just, it's an unusual, I don't think Malaysia is a good example of what happens elsewhere because it's it's a pretty unusual case. Um, in terms of the sultans, um, so there has been some worrying discourse in Malaysia over really the last decade. So this, this actually more than that, the, the, this, the initial glimmerings of, oh, this is an interesting development, um, really were after the 2008 elections in the state of Perak. And there are a couple of the, you know, there are nine hereditary sultans. A couple of them have really tried to push the envelope. So Johor and Perak in particular. Um, and so this was basically reconfiguring the, the elected government at the behest of the sultan, essentially. Um, and that didn't seem to diminish their support. Um, and so, and indeed, all the, the discussion before this election of Zahid, Najib, and so forth, you know, can they come back? So much of it was, well they're close to, you know, this one or that one is close to the Sultan. And indeed, two of the main UMNO players 
close to the same sultan, kind of that's a wash. Um, but so you have had in the last 10 to 15 years, some murmurings, especially from Johor, this cult-like sultan and his son about wanting to establish Thai style less majesty laws. And there have been some prosecutions, which is a new thing for Malaysia of people for insulting, basically insulting the majesty of a sultan. And it's generally in Johor. Um, and so that itself is really problematic because, you know, just in case it's not clear, the Thai law is not a good one to emulate, full stop, and definitely not a sign of democracy. But um, I, so far, there hasn't been um, regulatory or legislative headway toward that, but it could happen. So I had done another survey with Medeca Center um, in which we were trying to gauge, well, actually this one, they did one first and then we've added a question. I haven't gotten the results yet on this for the Sult support for the Sultan and their political role. But the earlier one was a, a youth, youth survey for those under 30, looking at support for the Sultan as a political figure. And it was actually higher levels of support among youth, um, not just Malays, but also Indians, a little bit lower among Chinese, but still like high 80%, you know, um, but really near universal support for the Sultan. Um, and that it's just, and I think that's actually strengthened now because in the political muddle that followed the election, you had the Sultan saving the day and saying, no, we need a national unity government, which you could read in any way you wanted. And the dominant reading seemed to be not just Malays, right? Um, and so this could be, that could be some of the institutional reform that follows. But that wouldn't be really a positive political reform. And Thailand is, to some extent, a perverse model for that at the behest of the sultans who think this might be a good idea. Does anybody want to add anything on strong executive? Um, question. So I saw, did you still want to raise a question? The person in the batik, did you have your hand raised? OK, then uh, let's take a couple questions. So you, please, and you. And who's got the mic? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Who thinks you next? <laughs> all right. So, thanks to all three of you for really interesting talks. Um, so. Uh, I guess I'm responding primarily to uh, Meredith's uh, talk because I, I I do uh, I'm as much hungry I'm a I'm at Yale um, and I work in um, East Malaysia right and in East Malaysia the case and the response to these elections have been uh, a sort of compounding cynicism about all politicians and about politicians very broadly uh, right. And I think talking to young voters, uh, you know, ethnographically there, that at the summer, like their expectations and their sort of sense of any sort of uh, quid pro quo in terms of voting was near non-existent, right? Like they, they, they thought they would vote just sort of because that was their, this little marginal thing they could do but the expectation they would get anything out of it or that there was any relationship between what they wanted and how they voted and what sort of policies would follow was I think not there. And so I'm interested whether or not those kinds of cynicism reverberates in, in sort of into your respective works. Hey, my name is Titus. Uh, my question was that uh, you spoke about how in Philippines from the time of the current form of government, democracy was not really uh, planted well. Uh, I'm from India and in India, we would probably say the same thing that over time we've chipped away at everything that stands for democracy. But, um, but culturally also there's a, there's a dis distinct wave of authoritarianism that was in play when, from when in India, for example, where we were framing our constitution, the Northern part wanted a more unitary government and the Southern part wanted a more federal government. Uh, would you say that Indonesia and or Malaysia also had such struggles with unitarianism and federalism? Uh, yeah, my, I'm Ron. I'm a student at Noah Wagner. Uh, my question is directed to Nava. 
Um, for now, um, you just mentioned the three factors that are uh, resulting in democratic backsliding, though I don't really, for the record, I don't really agree with the terms of democratic backsliding because all of those are the results of democratic system itself. Um, what are the factors or the drivers that makes, uh, with your last uh, closure comment, that Indonesia democratic backsliding is going faster at a faster rate compared to the other, even though it just started. What factors that cause those uh, Indonesia to uh, backslide faster than it was in other countries? Look, if, if you look at the structural factors, I mean, they had been there, you know, for a while. So I think what changed, you know, it's, it's in the past uh, few years is, you know, since since Jokowi came to power, basically, a lot of things um, that happened. And probably there is some unexpected reasons too, like the Islamist mobilization that, you know, that, that took everyone by surprise. And, um, and, and, and that just encourage Jokowi's tendency, for example, to have strong ministers into his cabinet, to have these old military guys. I mean, Luhud had been, you know, the, another retired military guy has been had been in his team since the beginning. Uh, but having more uh, kind of authoritarian policies and then that draconian law on mass organization, um, that, that came as a result of that mobilization. Um, and then, but there are other, other things, I think where structural factors also, um, play uh play up uh, in this regard so um oligarchy uh that's you know now it's it's become like the most popular word for indonesians uh, everyone loves to say oligarchy um because uh you know with the with this there is structural factors with the uh the financing of the party pol uh, political parties itself uh you know the lack of transparency the lack of public funding um, and then with the direct election, especially the what's that the open list uh, PR system, so that uh, makes election much more costly, and that kind of opens up room for more corruption and for the involvement of oligarchy in political parties. So you know, uh, initially when after reformasi, when there's new political parties, not all of them were ruled by oligarchy. Um, a lot of them actually had true social bases, uh, but but now uh, there is more uh, chance for that. Uh, because you know the part of the reasons is the legal requirements to establish new political party are becoming more and more difficult to costly. You know you have to have branches across you know I don't know is it um, seventy percent of provinces or something like that. Um, so that you know it's 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 a high bar for 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 I don't know, civil society groups for example that want to become a political party. It's just so uh, expensive and uh, you know almost impossible. Um, and then there's the government interference on the uh, electoral commission, you know, the approval of uh, and verification of new parties. Um, I think that it just shows that some of the, 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 the old ruling elites are kind of testing, they keep pushing the limits of, of democratization. Um, and uh, so that, so I don't know if, if I have to choose one, one factor, but I think what, what's obvious is that it's happening more recently uh rather than during a uh, sby era so i think the agency of, of the president of the people in his circle matter a lot here do you want to say anything about um federal state oh, well the, the philippines is a unitary state and there's been a, almost since the 1980s a demand for greater federalism, but nobody really knows what, what that is. Um, I personally don't think in terms of democracy, whether that matters. What we do have now is a lot of devolution of power to local officials, and that has not necessarily been beneficial to democracy, right? Because it has only empowered local families who then have a monopoly of power over their areas, making electoral politics less and less competitive and making the dominance of the economy in those areas even more, you know, easier, easier to account. So whether unitary or federal, I think in the Philippine case, I won't say about elsewhere, it doesn't really matter in terms of greater or lesser democracy. Yeah. So I can sort of tie these two questions together. So one way of responding to your initial question about the, you know, sense of empowerment and voting our surveys we've done beforehand, mostly youth, but not just them, found that there's a higher propensity to say that you will vote than to feel that your vote matters. And I don't think that's unique to Malaysia, but there was an assumption, which was borne out 
that voter turnout would be lower this time than previously. Voter turnout tends to be extraordinarily high, given that it's not required, um, for two reasons. One, because there was this expansion of the voting rolls, not just 18 to 21 year olds, but also those who had not previously bothered to register were now automatically registered. And if they hadn't bothered to register, they probably wouldn't bother to vote. Um, but also because we'd had these crazy political machinations of the last four years of you know, votes not mattering. You know, it doesn't matter who you voted for, you get a different coalition. And yet, it was still, uh, I think it's something like 74% overall, which is not bad. It's a decline from previously, but it's higher than most expected. So in that sense, you know, I, I think there was at the end of the day, this sort of last minute thought of, well, maybe this does matter. Maybe we can determine something. That said, for East Malaysia, there's a really different dynamic there in as much as so much of the concern is of being marginalized within Malaysia. So on the one hand, you have lots of youth who travel to Peninsular Malaysia, the Klang Valley and elsewhere um, to work or to Singapore, possibly Indonesia, um, and who don't see a future in East Malaysia. And you've had different strategies by East Malaysian parties over the years to figure out how to maximize their leverage. And this is where we get to this question of, of unitary versus federal states. Malaysia is a federation. It is fiscally amongst the most highly centralized federations in the world. Um, there has been no devolution of authority. Sabah and Sarawak, the coalitions there, are no, you know, it used to be that what is now GPS, for instance, was the Sarawak BN. They realized a couple elections back, that's not a good way to go because then you, the UMNO can take you for granted. If instead you're coy and you say, we're going to run separately and maybe if we like you, we'll join you after as a post-election coalition, you can exact some sort of concessions. And that was the plan. It looks like one of the areas in which I could imagine seeing some real concessions this time, because there was some movement toward this last time as well, is in greater devolution or greater rights for Saban Sarawak. Nothing that would be beyond the pale, things that were actually already guaranteed in the MA63, the Malaysia Agreement of 1963. Um, but one specific claim is, for instance, to have one third of seats be from Saban Sarawak, which is basically what the Malaysia Agreement was when Singapore was also part of that one third. Um, that's in Pakatan's manifesto. So they may still try to give that. Um, but in other words, there is this sort of um, centrifugal pressure there's some sense that on the East Coast in particular, due to things like oil royalties and different political histories and, and, and other factors, there could also be a pressure for greater devolution, but it hasn't really happened. Part of where this could occur though, is if for instance, the current arrangement by which not just BN, but also the Saban Sarawak parties, the East Malaysian parties are kingmakers collectively, that may allow them to exact some concessions. And that could perversely perhaps be what helps to empower younger East Malaysians to feel that their vote actually mattered. Um, but it's just, that's a fairly convoluted path. And so far, despite some glimmerings of, yes, we'll give concessions, really hasn't happened yet. So it's a little hard to say. And I wish we could go on and on, but we're cutting into the next session. So I think we all should thank you all very much for an incredibly interesting session. Thank you. Uh, so I think we will, uh, only have like a five minute break because I don't want to ruin um, the next session. But I also want to say that I forgot to thank all our sponsors for today. And, and in the next session, before we start, I'd like to do some thanks when we're recording. <laughs> <laughs>